Hello. <laughs> okay, so we're going to um, start the next section early since I am the guy who runs over time and talks too fast. Um, all right. So just in case you're keeping track of where we are, we have um, three more sessions that we're going to present. Model-based monitoring is this one. After that, we're doing application performance management. Joe does a deep dive on that. And then I do a talk on virtual infrastructure monitoring. That last talk is the last presentation, and it's the shortest. It'll be even shorter than, than Joe's talk. This one um, is, is very related to what Joe just talked about with metrics. So we're going to talk about Dell's approach to monitoring, which I believe is unique, um, which is model-based. We don't need to hear my background again. So what we're going to talk about is what is model-based monitoring and what are the benefits and examples of it? And then in the context of Foglight, I'm going to talk about how to create a new model and then talk about some of the details of that. So there are an awful lot of different kinds of data that I talked about from all different kinds of domains. Um, and in, in the APM, application performance monitoring domain, we care about all that data. Okay? But what we want to do is we want to make sure that we structure that data in a meaningful way. So raw data is really helpful um, in static environments. So if you have one program that runs on a single machine, you can just gather static data on it and you can completely understand that nothing changes. But if things change, then you really need to have a different approach to how you're gathering your data. And Joe did mention the structured data and he had a really nice picture. I don't have a picture, I have a lot of words. Um, the real problem in general with management of any kind is that the environments are not static at all. Um, it is very common for there to be changes in how an application is run. So you may add a new server to a cluster of app servers. You may have a database grid technology, which means where your database is running changes over time. You may have dynamic software components, so there may be new libraries that get added. You may be running your application on a shared web logic server, and then someone upgrades uh, the JDBC driver, or someone upgrades the version of Hibernate, or someone upgrades the version of Struts, which basically changes your code. It changes. Um, code can be uh, changed to make new calls. There may be a new web service. There may be a new database that gets introduced to an application. And then on the virtualization side, because you've got that abstraction of the system, pretty much anything can change at any time. You can, be think, you can think that you have a server called myapp.com. You, you may have a server that you're, that you're running, and you may think that it has certain resources, but those resources can actually be changed by an ESX administrator with the click of a button. So they can decide all of a sudden, you don't have four CPUs assigned anymore, you only have two. And you used to have eight gigabytes of RAM, but now you have four gigabytes of RAM and it's shared. It's no longer reserved for you. And that can severely impact your performance. And that can happen at runtime without you knowing. What the trick is, is that we need to be able to gather the data and structure it so you can figure out that the reason your website is slower is because someone changed your virtual machine configurations. That's hard, but we have a technique for that. On the storage side, things are even more complex. So somebody may change the way that a storage fabric runs, and then all of a sudden, you don't even know where your data is being stored, but it's being, stor it's being stored more slowly, and it has an impact on your database performance, which has an impact on your application. Very complicated. So, I would assert that the only way to deal with this complexity is to create a runtime and dynamic model of the environment, of everything. So of the application all the way down to the infrastructure, and including the network infrastructure, including the database, including all the things we talked about. So that model has to be able to change over time. It has to have state associated with it. So in other words, you put alarms on it, or you know the state of a certain piece, so you know that a machine wasn't running well, or you know that an application had an application problem, or you know that a database was slow. Um, you have to have the metrics associated with the model. And this is where Joe talked about structured data. 
So we want to basically have a system that has nothing but structured data. We don't want tables of metrics that you can look at. We want metrics inside of objects, inside of a structure, so that you know whether or not that CPU wait time has anything to do with your application. Okay, so the model it must reflect the structure of the application. So those tier pictures that we showed with different kinds of nodes in an application, we want to create objects in memory that represent that. And that's why we've introduced this. We have uh, patents on this approach, but it's a, it's a good approach. So what are the models? So models are basically objects. It's an in-memory collection of objects that represent what we've collected. So you may, so that the, the box on the upper right-hand corner shows CPU memory and disk. You may collect three metrics from, from an agent that you have. The CPU utilization, the amount of memory that's available, and the amount of disk space that's available. And you could put them in a table, and that's interesting. But what we do instead is we make a graph of objects. So based on gathering that data from a, a system or a host, we create a host object. Then we create a CPU object and a memory object and a disk object to represent the, the, the context for that data. And then we attach the metrics to those objects. So we attach the CPU utilization to the CPU object. And what we found is that even though this takes up more space, it takes up more memory for this approach, it allows us to move things around. In fact, it has a whole bunch of benefits. So before we, we talk about the benefits, I'm going to show you what monitoring is like without models. So this is a typical monitoring system. There's a, a central server called the management server that takes in all the metrics. And you have agents. Agents are pieces of software that are gathering the metrics and sending them to the server. So the way that this monitoring system works is that you get some data from an agent, and it's a table of data. And through a series of steps, and it doesn't matter what the exact steps are, most products simply store that data in the form in which it was gathered. It might be split up or modified subtly, slightly, but mostly it's just stored the way the person found it. So I found CPU data, I'm just going to store it in the database the way it was. Another agent, and then it's, it's of course retrieved for display. Another agent will find other data and it will store it in the database and then it will display it in the management server and then I can show it on a, on a web page. Now this is fine. The problem is, is that the, the way that the data gets collected dictates how it is stored and it dictates how it is represented in the management server, which often dictates how it gets shown in the user interface. This is a static system. If I choose to write an agent that does something slightly different, I can break large portions of this system. It's very brittle. With models, what we do instead is we have a separation between how the data is gathered and how it gets stored and how it gets represented. So the agent will gather the data in the same way but we bring it into the management server and we transform it and we store it in a different form. We create objects that represent the data and then we associate metrics with that object. We store the metrics and the objects separately and this is really important as well because the objects tend to be less static and they change differently than metrics. Metrics, remember, are values over time, time series metrics. If we store them separately, then we can manage that separately as big data. So that data could be, you know, like Joe was saying, thousands or millions of metrics stored for decades. Okay? And storing that with the objects doesn't make sense. We need to roll that data up. We need to aggregate it and manage it. Okay, if another agent comes in and it's, it gathers uh, some data, we transform it again and we create an object. We create we store it in the objects table, and we create metrics, and we store it in the metrics table. So the same thing. But the other thing that we can do is we can note whether these two objects are related. That's that last arrow. Not that one, that one. So we may know there's a relationship between these two objects. That green one might be a web server, and that orange one or yellow one might be a database. We can discover those relationships. Those relationships can change over time, and this is how we make the system more dynamic. 
So I guess we'll pause for a few minutes and we'll do the signing of the sheets if it's necessary and then I'll start up again at 4.15, okay? I'll just review this quickly because I did have one question during the break. So we have, again, metrics and objects stored separately. Objects are going to represent things in the system. So there'll be um, uh, things like uh, computers and web servers and application servers. And metrics are values plotted over time. So the example that I, I used and, and you know, one of the things that's unique about our approach here is that we don't have to know in advance what these types of objects are going to be. We can create new types. So I could create a management server that monitors the temperature in this room. And I would have an object that represents the room, and I would have a metric that represents the temperature. That metric would, would plot the temperature as frequently as I chose to measure it. So it could be every five minutes for an entire week. Okay? Then I could extend that by measuring the temperature in all the rooms. I would have one object for each room, and I would have the same temperature metric for each one of those rooms, and they would be connected to one another. Okay? So, why do we do this? Why do we go to the trouble of make it to using all this space for objects when we could just store the metrics? Well, the first thing is the models more closely represent what we're monitoring. So we actually have things that represent basically the picture that the application owner would draw if you said draw your application. We can represent those in objects. But the models are also able to do something really unique, which is join data together from different collections. So in this case here, what if these two agents were both monitoring a host? And this one was collecting CPU utilization and memory, and this one was measuring disk I.O. and memory. I would actually be able to push that data to the management server and have the, that data end up associated with the same object. If you don't do your monitoring in a model-based way, you can't do that. You'll actually end up with the previous picture where the data is stored separately. So in this picture, I would have, for the same host, I would have CPU and memory data in this table, and the other one would have memory data and disk I.O. And that wouldn't make any sense. Okay, so that's the, the main benefit here, or one of the benefits. We're able to get the data associated with the same objects. And that lets us write our agents and rewrite our agents to collect new data. So if I find out there's a new API that lets me collect per process data, then I can do that and I can associate it with the same object. The other thing is I can preserve the relationship between the objects. So, and by the way, that relationship might change. So I may have a host, that host has a CPU, and I know that that CPU is part of that host, but that host may be a virtual machine running on a particular ESX server. That might change over time. I may be running on this ESX server today, and tomorrow I move to another one. And that can become important when we're trying to diagnose application problems. Because maybe when I was running on ESX Server 1, nobody else was running on it, and I was able to get lots of resources. When it changed to, the, to ESX Server 2, there are lots of people running on that ESX server, and I'm not able to get resources, and I'm slower as a result. The other thing that models do is separate the data from time series metrics. So that allows us to do lots of tricky database things to manage big data in, in the form of time series metrics. So what are in models? Well, we have a bunch of things. Models have relationships with one another, and I don't mean that they're friends. I mean that they can be associated. So again, a host has a CPU, or a web server runs on a host. Models also have properties. So an example of a property would be the name of a host, or maybe um, the brand of computer that it's running on, or the operating system version. That's another property. A property is a value that doesn't change a lot, okay, or at all. 
a metric is a little bit different. A metric is a value that you would measure that you would expect to change. So again, if I'm measuring the temperature of the room, I expect it to change over time. If I'm measuring the number of seats in the room, there is no point in me measuring the number of seats every five minutes. It's not going to change. The number of seats in this room is a property of this room. The temperature is a metric. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. The other thing that we can do is have lists. So a property, so imagine we have an object that represents this room. I could also have an object that represents each chair. So then I can track who sits in each chair over time. Um, if I have the room object, I will have a list that represents all the chairs that are in the room. So a list is really just a list of objects that are related to one another object. So moving on, um, objects are created when we transform the data. So remember that transformation, um, that transformation graphic. So we collect the data, we create the objects, we might also delete or change the objects. So, you know, and I've, I've said this example before, a host model, it has objects that represent the processors and the memory and the disks and the network cards. It has a representation of the operating system. So if you look, and we cover this in the last session, if you look at the host model that we create in Foglight, it has an operating system object and it has all the properties of the operating system, which would include the brand, the, the vendor, the version number, the patch level. So the model for the host also accounts for ESX servers and other things like that. So we'll cover that in more detail later. So this isn't just a fiction. This is actually the way we've been doing monitoring for coming up on seven years, I guess. We've deployed model-based monitoring to tens of thousands of customers. It is the most flexible form of monitoring. It is so flexible that we have been able to use the platform we've created for monitoring things that are not in the application monitoring space. So we actually took this product and started monitoring electrical utilities and the way that the network works to support electrical utilities for, for smart meters. Um, we've been able to also update our product for huge changes in the industry. So when we started writing Foglight um, in about 2004, uh, virtualization was the way that you did uh, QA, and that's about it. People did not run on top of VMware at that time. Uh, virtualization is now pervasive. It's, I think it's something like 80% of workloads run on virtual environments. It might even be higher than that. Um, you know, we were able to continue using the same system, even though virtualization was introduced, to the, even uh, able to use the same user interface. We didn't have to change our user interface because our model already accounted for these kinds of changes. We've seen new application architectures come to light as well. We're able to handle them. We're actually able to handle new application architectures in real time at runtime. Uh, we've seen cloud come into the play. So beyond virtualization, we're talking about infrastructure that you don't even know, own. You don't even know where it's running. So we've been able to handle all of these changes. So we've already talked about some of these benefits. How did we get that? This slide is in here twice. Look at that. Who wrote this? Look at That's the same as that. I should take that out. OK. What's that? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, that's right. We'll blame X-Ray. Um, OK. So another benefit that we have is we're able to handle when the APIs change. And remember, I made that list of all the different ways you can collect data, SNMP, SSH, WMI, vendor, vendor APIs. You can change the way you gather the data, but feed it to the same model, and everything will be OK. And we've actually done this. We've rewritten our host monitoring agents more times than I'd like to admit. Um, because it's a bit embarrassing, but we've been able to continue to use the same model and not change things. So we created a structure for monitoring infrastructure that didn't have to change even though the collection APIs changed. And I am very confident that our infrastructure monitoring could handle um, even brand new operating systems with no problem. 
we've already talked about virtualization, but we were not we were able to continue running with the same host model. Application dependencies. Um, I guess this is just an expansion of all of the uh, previous points. So, um, you know, we're able to measure, in addition to gathering data on WebLogic and WebSphere and JBoss and IIS and Tomcat and the database pieces, we're able to map the dependencies between them. So if the structure of the application changes, so think in terms of I make a request to a website and that website, my request goes to Tomcat server A and then it goes to JBoss server B and then it goes to the database. And then another person makes the same request and maybe it goes to a different set of servers. Okay, those dependencies can change at runtime. Those dependencies may, may change in a significant way. Maybe the way I set up my environment, I'm not using one of my application servers. It's idle, none of the requests are going to it. That's important to know. So we're able to measure these dynamic dependencies and then use them it, for application performance monitoring. We're able to diagnose problems as a result of them. And we were able to do that without changing anything about the data gathering or the modeling. So we were able to label, layer that extra object modeling in on top of the existing models. So this is an example of that. So this is, this is something that Joe built and Yinghua built, and this is dependency graph for an application. But it's a real-time runtime graph. So this is an end-user transaction that runs on a web server, and then it runs on a cluster of app servers. There's a cache involved, and then there's a database at the back end. This model is built with a whole set of objects that live above the individual app servers and, and web servers. And those arrows may change at runtime. Okay, maybe this server goes down and it doesn't get any more requests. Maybe we add another app server. We add a fourth app server, but we added it today. If I look yesterday, I won't see that app server. If I look today, I will see transactions running to it. You can only do this with model-based monitoring. There's no way to manage this otherwise. You have to know in advance what the structure is going to be. So how do you create a new model? So I, I did mention before that not only is our system model-based so that it can respond to changes in the environment, which is very important for application performance monitoring, but we can actually create new types in a live running Foglight system. I can take any instance of Foglight that's running in the world today, and I can go in and create a new type to represent this room and a metric to represent temperature. It's a dynamic system even from the perspective of the types of objects and metrics and properties that are running on it. That can be changed at any time. And you don't need special permissions, you just need a bit of knowledge. So we can create any model we want at any time, okay? So the example that I use is not the example I made up today with rooms, it's actually an organizational chart for a company. So there's a company that I've imagined called MyCloud, and it, offer, it offers services on the internet, and it has departments, different departments inside of that company. The departments are IT, so information technology, operations, and sales. So the IT department looks after applications, databases, and infrastructure. Operations looks after administration, accounting, and human resources. And sales is just a department that doesn't contain anything else. So this is a graph that shows all the different departments in my imaginary company, okay? I can create this model in Foglight. This has nothing to do with application monitoring, but I can create this model in Foglight. In order to do that, it's like any object-oriented exercise. I look at it and I have to decide what are the key types that I have in my system. So I'm going to go back to this, and the key types that I have are organization. I could have said department, but I'm going to be a bit more generic and abstract. Organization. And then the second type that you would come up with would be employee. But if for this exercise, I've decided to add a third type for a manager. Okay, so an organization is 
a department. Any one of those boxes on the previous slide is an organization. An employee is somebody who works for the company. A manager is a special type of employee who looks after an organization and is responsible for a set of employees. Does that make sense to people? Uh, it's a pretty standard model. Okay, so what we need to know out of our model is what smaller organizations are part of bigger ones, who runs each organization, who works in each organization, who reports to a certain manager, and we need contact information for all these employees. Okay, that's the exercise we're trying to do. So we're basically creating what we call an organization structure or an org structure for a company that includes all the employee data. We can do that in Foglight by having an organization object and it will have a property called org leader that will be a manager. Each organization will also have a property that is a list called child orgs, which is a list of organizations that belong in it. So we said before that the uh, operations department included accounting and administration. Accounting and administration would be in the child orgs property for operations. And each manager will have a list of, they're called direct reports. These are the employees who report to that manager. So a manager will have a property called direct reports. So that, that's pretty basic. The important thing about creating models is understanding the identity. Because in a model-based system, the identity of the object determines whether or not it, it exists. The identity has to be unique for every single object. So there can only be one object with a particular identity at any time. Now, you might think we do this using serial numbers or global IDs. We don't. What we do instead is we mark special property fields as being identity fields. And then I can teach you a big English word, um, which is idempotent. <laughs> and it basically means only one of this thing can be created. So if I have two property fields, first name and last name, and I mark them both as identity. I can only create one employee that has a single first name and last name. Now in the real world that won't actually work because people have, quite often have the same name. But for the purpose of our exercise, that's how the employee object will work. So identity is very important. For an organization, we have to be careful about how we choose the identity. We don't want the name of the manager to be in the identity for the organization, because what if we fire the manager and he doesn't work for the company anymore? We don't want to have to create a new organization. So manager is not going to be part of the organization identity. We do not want to actually include any of the child organizations in the identity either, because we may choose to reorganize our company. We may decide that accounting belongs in sales. And if we do that, we don't want to have to create a new sales department and a new or a new sales object and a new, um, and a new operations object. So what we're going to do instead for organization is just use the name of the organization. The manager should not include the organization he or she manages in their identity because, again, they may leave the company or they may get promoted. Maybe the person who was running accounting is now running sales. So we don't want to have to create a new manager object just because the person's job changed. So these are pretty simple identity issues. When it comes to the application performance monitoring objects that we create, our identity issues are very difficult. So I just want to pause here and talk about that. A good example is, again, the identity of a host. What's the identity of a host in a world where the host may be running on any computer and be moved at any time to another physical machine? It's very difficult to get the identity of the host to be right. We go into this in some detail, but it can't be, for example, the IP address because your networking configuration might change. It can't be the name of your operating system because you might upgrade that. Um, it can probably be the fully qualified domain name, but there are issues with that as well. So the identity is the hardest part of modeling. It's the hardest part. So, very quickly, this model, 
The employee is going to have identity fields last name and first name. The manager is going to have the same identity fields. It's going to have a direct reports collection that is not going to be part of the identity. Can anyone tell me why we would not have a direct reports collection as part of the identity? The reason is, is if you, you don't want that to be part of the identity because if you add a new employee to that manager, you'd have to create a new manager object. We don't want to do that. The organization will have identity of org name. We will link the org leader property to the manager. So every organization will have a manager and it will have a list of child orgs. So how does this, what does this look like in Foglight? Well, this is what it looks like visually. So these are the pictures we'll be able to create. I'll skip this part because I don't think it's that interesting. I'll come back to it. This is what it looks like. This is the actual fog light model structure. Um, so what we have, and I wish I had a pointer, but I don't. Um, we have at the very top a type definition for the employee object. And it just says the name of the type is employee. It extends something called topology object. Topology object is a special type that gives us all kinds of things for free. It has a list of properties. You'll notice that one of them is name. Another one is last name and first name. Why do I have name, last name, and first name? Well, we'll see a little bit later that I can do some manipulation of properties and other properties. Um, it also has a job title property, phone number, email address, so some contact information for that employee so I can know what they do, how to phone them, how to email them. There is also a property called organization, and it is of type organization. So every employee object has a link to its organization. Every employee is associated with an organization object. And then I close off the type down here. Now, you'll notice that every property has a type. Most of these properties are of type string. So we can handle standard Java types inside of um, a Foglight uh, model structure. Manager is much simpler. In manager, I'm able to extend the employee type. So manager gets all of these properties by default, and it adds one. It adds a list of direct reports. That's it. Now, one thing I need to go back and note is that last name and first name have this special marker, is identity equals true. That means that those two properties determine the identity of the employee object. If I create an employee object, last name Vona, first name Jeff, I will create an object. If I create a second one, last name Rustad, first name Joe, I will get a separate object. If I try to create another one, last name Rustad, first name Joe, which I'm always trying to do because I'd really like another Joe, I can't. The system will not let me. I can only have one Joe. You know, one Joe Rustad. I can have someone else named Joe. They have to have a different last name. Okay, the organization object. Again, we have a type definition. It's going to extend topology object. It will have an org name. The org name is the identity property. Org leader is going to be the person who is managing this organization. It is a property of type manager. Don't worry about that containment stuff. It just determines how alarms roll up in the system. The organization also has a property called child orgs. It is of type organization and it is a list. It says here is many equals true. So I have one manager and zero or more child orgs. Okay? So that's the type definition for organization. I can take these type definitions and feed them into a live Foglight system and I will be able to create these types. So I just go into, there's an administration UI in Foglight that allows me to load these types in directly. I can just, I can type it directly into that box. Okay, and I type them in and then I load them and the types exist right away. So that's a very handy feature. Okay, so what's really interesting about our model-based system 
is that the models can be modified at runtime. So not, no, not only can I add new types, I can change those types. And there is a very common use case for that, which is adding metrics to an object. If I found a new metric that I could collect, I could add it to any existing object. So we do that by versioning the type definitions. So we're able, I'm able to actually put in a type, I could put in the entire type if I wanted to, or I could just put in a fragment that shows what's changed. So this fragment here, I don't know if you can read that, but it's basically a fragment for the employee object. And I've added in a property called Twitter account. It's a new property, doesn't exist. I have not added anything else. When I'm done, will I have a new version of employee that only has the property Twitter account? Or will I have all of the previous properties plus this new property? What do you think? It will merge the types. So it will add this to the previous list. So remember, if I go back up here, I will still have all of these properties and I will have the new property. I could change the type of the property as well, but the merging gets a bit more complex. What happens to existing objects is a bit more complex. But for simple changes, the, the obvious thing will happen. So that's the way our system works. All right, let me get back to. So there's also a system in Foglight, and you guys are going are, are, are to be playing with this a little later this week. <clears throat> you can basically write Java-like code that creates instances of objects. So you go into the system, and I do this all the time. I have a whole bunch of groovy scripts that create objects. And you can create them, and they, and they exist right away. So the end result of this, and, th and all of this isn't just fictional. I created this example a couple of years ago, and I posted it on um, our community. And it, it includes a cartridge, so you can actually create these objects. You end up with um, an organization that has these departments, the IT operations and sales departments, and the sub uh, organizations are in there. Um, it creates a real data structure. This is a screen snapshot from Foglight that shows the actual data. And if you want to, you can create dashboards. This looks a little bit like Joe's dependency graph. Um, when I created this snapshot, we didn't have the uh, nice curvy lines. Um, so, but the point is, is that you can add your types to Foglight, and then you can visualize those types using the same mechanisms that are in there already. So. Going back to the model types themselves, that type definition we saw is called a topology type definition. In Foglight, all of the types, there's no special magical way of creating the types. Every type that we create in our system for application performance monitoring, for infrastructure monitoring, they're all available for inspection. You can just go into a Foglight system and look at a bunch of XML files that define every single type. Um, you can also inspect them by looking inside of the data browser or inside of the schema browser. So the, the point here is that if you think about Foglight as a monitoring, an object-oriented monitoring system, it's completely inspectable. You can look at all of the objects. And again, you can create custom types. So getting back to that schema, what's in a type definition? There's a type name. There might be an inheritance piece. So I extend topology object or I extend employee. And then there are properties. Three different kinds of properties. So, well, I guess actually four. You can have just a standard, like a string property, like last name, first name. You can have a reference to another object. So there was org leader for organization. You can have a list. So there was um, direct reports inside of manager. The other thing you can have is a metric. So this gets back to Joe's point about structured data. And it gets back to that graphic with the objects. Metrics can be defined in a topology type. So you associate a metric with an object by putting a reference to it inside of it. OK, so when, and that goes way back to, well, I don't think I have an example in this talk. The other thing that you can do in our type definitions is put in an annotation. 
So an annotation can tell us a special thing about a property. So the key notions inside of a type, <laughs> and this is true of any object-oriented system, we just expose it to the end users. Um, you have the identity, so any property that has that marker is identity is part of the identity of that object. You have to have at least one field, um, but you can have multiple fields marked is identity. Okay, you only get one object created per identity set. So remember, only one Joe Rustad. Um, anything that's not marked as identity, and this is an interesting aspect of the system, anything that's not marked as identity is considered a non-identity property. For all of those, we track every single change over time. So if you had a property that was just a string that said the version of my software, 1.0, 1.1, 2.1, 2.2. Every time that changes, we set the new value, but we also track the change so that you can get back every single change over time. And in fact, you can take an object and you can say, give me the version of this object for two years ago, and it will change the version number to show the historical value for that. That's not the same as a metric. Okay, this is a little bit different. This is a property change series. Okay, so it's not storing a metric value every time we do a collection. It is storing the instances at which something changes. Only the changes are shown. The last thing that we do in model-based monitoring that's important is automatic alarm propagation. So an alarm is a little bit of business logic, a little bit of code, that executes and decides whether or not something important has happened. So we may say, um, if the CPU utilization on this host is over 80%, that is a warning state. And we will set an alarm that will say, CPU is too high. Please look at the, look at the computer and make sure it's not on fire. Um, and we will have that alarm to be in a warning state and we'll attach it to that object. We attach it to the host object. And then we do this thing called alarm propagation, which means in a tree of objects, we will take the worst state of any of the children and move it up. So if I have a host object and I have two CPUs, and one CPU is in a warning state and the other one is in a fatal state. Fatal is worse than warning, the host is in a fatal state. It gets the worst state of its children. Just like any parent. Your, the parent's mood is determined by the mood of the worst child. <laughs> so, same kind of idea. So, we're going to look at the host type. All right, yeah, we are going to look at the host type. So, um, and we, we talk about this in a little bit more detail in another talk, but um, we do have in Foglight a standard object called the host. It is a standard um, for any uh, system. It's used by all of the cartridges that we sell with Foglight. Um, it allows for virtualization. It allows for um, the notion of the host from the perspective of a Java, a JVM, or a .NET CLR. Um, the benefits of a standard host type is that we've been able to create a common set of dashboards, and even though we change how we collect the host or even where the host comes from, uh, we haven't had to change those dashboards. Uh, different data from different agents can create the same host objects. In fact, sometimes, I'll give you a real world example. If we're doing our embedded Java instrumentation, so you have a JMX, or a, sorry, a JBoss instance, and it's running some code, we will know the name of the host and we'll create a host object. We don't have an agent gathering any host data. We don't even know the type of that host. We don't know the operating system. We don't know anything about it. We will still create a host object and create a relationship between that app server, JBoss, and that host. Later, we can choose to deploy our infrastructure monitoring and gather all the information about that host. And at that time, all that data will go to the same host instance and it will give us more information in the right context. Okay, I've got nine more minutes. So this is the actual type definition for host. You'll see at the top, 
the name of the host, it extends some object, we don't even know what it is. The identity for the host is something called name. So this has been a very hard debate inside of Quest and Dell to come up with the actual identity for the host, but it ends up just being the fully qualified domain name. So it'll be mycomputer.mycompany.org or .com or whatever. Bunch of other properties in here. I mentioned earlier that we have an operating system object. So there is a property in a host called OS, and it is it basically points to an operating system object that will have all the details about the operating system. We have objects for memory and storage and network. We have one for the CPUs as well. We have a property called running, which contains a list of things that are running on that host. That property is not often filled in. We aren't always doing process monitoring on a host. So it is an example of a dynamic property that will get filled in at runtime. OK. Uh, trying to see if we have any metrics here. Here we go. So we have, we have a metric down here called virtual host count. So in order to make a property into a metric, you just give it type metric. And what we will do behind the scenes is we store that property value not in the object part of the database. We store it in with all the other metrics. And we can measure that. We can have values for that metric for all of time. We also are able to do, so there's another metric there called num processes. We're also able to do these really interesting things with properties um, where we can have the, the value of a property calculated by a script. So you put in these two special annotations, and then you can embed a script inside of here that will calculate this property from another property. OK? So a couple of notes about topology objects. So it is the base type in one way or another for almost everything that we do. It does, by default, that alarm aggregation and propagation. So having alarms associated with a topology object and having the worst state roll up. That is implemented by this type. Um, it has some standard features that we, that we like to use as well. So I have the definition for it in here too. But I don't know if I want to talk about that in the last six minutes. Let's see. Some of the key values for topology object, it has, again, those alarm aggregation things. So it has metrics that track the alarm count and then the alarm count by state. So it will tell you how many warning alarms. There is a change summary property, which is a list of the topology changes. So remember, I said a property. I will track the changes of it over time. Change summary contains those changes. So if I change my operating system or my, my software version from 1.0 to 1.1, I will have a change summary object. And change count is the number of changes that happen over time. So these are interesting features that we've implemented on top of our system. So this is another thing that you can do. And I, I think this is pretty much it. So this is the last um, interesting slide. So again, I, I mentioned this before, you can put groovy scripts inside of the properties. So long name is a property that's in topology object. And it is actually um, calculated by this script. And I can tell you, does anyone know what this script does? Can anyone read it and tell me what it does? Anyone want to take a stab at it? No, Joe, you don't get to. So for sure, long name contains the name. OK, so scope is a special object you can use inside of these scripts that refer to this object. So any object, I'm going to look at, my own, at myself and get the value of my name property and I'm going to add it to this string. And then I'm going to put something in parentheses. And it looks like what I'm doing is getting the type. So what long name is, is the name of the object, and then in brackets, the type of the object. Okay, So 
rather than having a property value where I assigned that, I just calculate it using a groovy script. That's a very powerful concept in our model-based system. It makes it very dynamic and reliable. So just to wrap things up, what have we covered? So we've talked about how models work. We've talked about the benefits of them. And we've done some examples inside of the Foglight domain. And we did an example outside of the Foglight domain. Talked about how to create custom models. And then we looked at some of the details of the model definition. So you guys will get to use this a little bit later on. Um, and other than that, that's it. In the last uh, four minutes or so, I'll take any questions. No questions? You will get a copy of these presentations later, by the way. So if you wanted to look at the de type definitions in more detail, you can do that later. OK? OK. Thanks.